So let's look at hydrogenation of ethene. What's happening here is we're reacting ethene with hydrogen to make ethane. So we're breaking that double bond and the hydrogens are coming in and adding to this molecule. So these are examples of more addition reactions. The reaction conditions for this reaction are that we need a metal catalyst and we use either nickel or platinum. So going back to this one, hydrogenation. So we need a catalyst, otherwise this reaction is too slow. And as I go forward, you'll see that some of these reactions need catalysts and others, we just need different temperatures, pressures, that sort of thing. But you will have to remember the reaction conditions. So now on to halogenation. So what we're doing is we're adding a halogen to ethylene, in this case bromine, and the double bond breaks and the bromine adds on to form 1,2-dibromoethane, which I dis discussed earlier. And halogenation, you can use different halogens other than just bromine, such as chlorine or fluorine. Okay, so as I said, the halogens are incorporated. Now we'll look at hydration of ethane, ethene, excuse me. This is where ethene and water make ethanol. So here we have the water molecule being incorporated over the double bond to form ethanol with an OH group or an alcohol group as we call it. A catalyst is needed once again, either dilute sulfuric or phosphoric acid, which is H2SO4 or H3PO4. Now on to oxidation of ethene. This is where we go from ethylene to ethylene glycol. And this is the formula, the structural formula for ethylene glycol, as you remember, with the two alcohol groups. Now there's two different ways of oxidizing ethylene, either with dilute potassium permanganate, which is this formula here, potassium permanganate, which is an oxidizer. And these are the structural formulae, which are good for you to see what's happening in the reaction, but to cut it down into shorthand, we can just write the molecules themselves. C2H4 gas with KMnO4 goes to C2H4 OH in brackets 2. And this is a liquid ethylene glycol. And another way to make ethylene glycol is with different reaction conditions. In this case, oxygen and water. And you get exactly the same products. Ethylene glycol I'll discuss in a moment, just for you to know that it's an antifreeze. So here we are with ethylene glycol. It's an antifreeze and it's used in car radiators. Now we don't really need ethylene glycol here in Australia because it doesn't get cold enough. But overseas where it does get cold, they need to put ethylene glycol in their cars to prevent the engine heating up. Now ethane diol is simply ethylene glycol This is just the IUPAC name for it, okay? As I said, ethylene glycol has a lower freezing point and a higher boiling point than water. So it, it allows in the radiator for the water to not freeze, okay? So just looking at our IUPAC name here, I'll just draw it again so you can remember the structure. If you'll remember, it's an alkane with two OH groups. Oops, OH. And so 1,2-ethane-diol, these are the functional groups, the OH groups. And when there's two of them on an alkane, it's called a diol. So this is ethane, because it's single bond, diol, and the 1,2, again, name the carbons, is the position of these functional groups. And another great thing about ethylene glycol is that it doesn't cause corrosion, so it won't ruin your engine. Now, ethylene glycol is also used in the manufacture of magnetic tapes and photographic film, although I guess we don't use too much of that anymore in this digital day and age. Um, and it's also used for making synth synthetic fibres. Now, other products of ethylene, there are hundreds and thousands of them, but here's just a few. Also used to make intermediate compounds, which we saw earlier with our addition reactions, such as styrene to make polystyrene, vinyl chloride to make polyvinyl chloride or PVC, 
And these end products are polymers with certain characteristics pertaining to their applications. So looking at polyethylene, about 60% of ethene is used to make polyethylene, which is a very important and useful polymer. And I can tell you that I've got plastics all around me, we all do, and uh, I couldn't actually imagine life without plastics because we use so many of them. Packaging, you know, pens for example, all sorts of things, like in this picture here. Now, so it's used in general plastic applications. So now let's look at some products that we've discussed today and their specific uses. So we started by looking at polyethylene. It's used for plastic film, crates and pipes. Ethylene dichloride is used as the raw material to make the vinyl chloride monomer for PVC production. We've looked at PVC, briefly, polyvinyl chloride, for plastic pipes, for gutterings, and for soft furnishings. We looked at ethanol. Now ethanol is a solvent, an organic solvent. It's also put into fuel and it's also as a drink, alcohol, alcoholic drinks. We also looked at ethylene glycol, which is used as an antifreeze, polystyrene for plastic packaging and insulation. We looked at 1,2-dibromoethane, which is a petrol additive. It actually increases excuse me, uh, dibromoethane as a petrol additive and chloroethane. These two are also solvents, okay, organic solvents. So chloroethane as a solvent and also as a refrigerant, either in fridges or in cars. So now we'll look at the last type of reaction that I'll discuss for today, which is substitution reactions of alkanes. So we're starting with an alkane and as you know, alkanes are saturated, so there's no double bond we can break. So you can't add anything, we need to just substitute. So here we have bromination, where we're using bromine, and we're adding a bromine, and one hydrogen comes off to form hydrogen bromide, and here bromoethane. And again, with halogens, we could use chlorine or fluorine for different uses of different molecules. Now this substitution occurs in the presence of UV light. So it doesn't happen by itself. In the lab, we'd have to use a UV light for the reaction to take place. And if you remember, that's because alkanes are not very reactive. So we need to push it along. So that wraps up what we've been talking about today with the uses of ethylene and the different organic reactions that we can, that we can use ethylene for to make different products for different purposes, such as plastics. So let's start with our questions now, and question 11. Why are alkenes more reactive than alkanes? Now, this is because alkenes have a reactive double bond. As you can see from this addition reaction, we can break that double bond and add other molecules over that bond to produce here, for example, 1,2-dichloroethane. And as I said, earlier in the lesson, the double bond creates a concentration of negative electrostatic charge over that double bond, which means it's very reactive. Now question 12, identify the homologous series and functional group that describes ethylene. And you've been given some choices here. This is the homologous series, alkane, alkene, alkyne and alkanol. And these are their functional groups a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, and an OH group. So where does ethylene fit into these groups? Of course, it has a double bond, so it's an alkene. So that's our answer for this question. Similarly, if it were to ask for eth uh, an eth ethylkyne group, excuse me, it would be, it would be a triple bond. So question 13, what is meant by a substitution reaction and does an alkane or an alkene undergo these reactions? Well, it's alkanes because one atom is substituted for another. It's not added, it's substituted. So remembering back to our diagram here with the bromine, the bromine comes in and a hydrogen comes off. So just remember that it's alkanes. So as I said, for example, a hydrogen atom 
can be replaced with a halogen atom, but light energy in the form of UV energy is required. So just to recap, as I said, this could be a chloro group or a fluoro group. And substitution reactions are always with alkanes. And these reactions are slow. As I said before, we need UV light to get them moving along because alkanes are not very reactive.